So maybe uh, I will give you just a few notes on the agenda. We'll start with uh, Dr. Lilas Trabelski, who's uh, a managing director of uh, TBH family office, as well as uh, university teachers. She will uh, go through some specific aspects of the ESG when it comes to impact-driven startup. We will then uh, speak uh, with uh, Younes Yaksha, who's the co-founder of GAIN. Uh, Geneva Angel Investor Network, who will guide us through like fundamental when it looks at uh, venture capital. And then we will really move to an interactive uh, workshop uh, type of, um, of event. It's not work. Oh, it's back. Anyway, and uh, with Ma Marin uh, Kneif, uh, who's the co founder of the startup uh, Mia and Noah. She will, she will bring the expertise in, um, in food and beverage uh, retail industries, and she will try to build with the audience a sustainable concept and business model with a focus on zero waste. And finally, she will then like switch the role and, uh, and then move into the, the pitch and uh, kind of like present us what actually it is uh, on a, in a concrete case uh, to run um, uh, startup, impact driven startup. Without further ado, uh, I call uh, Madame Tabeski. So, still not working. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have. Ah, okay. Thank you. Okay, th can you hear me okay? I feel I'm very short here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, thank you so much for um, coming to our session. Uh, so, what I am going to cover a little bit is just to make sure is, is the ESG aspect. So just to make sure that we all kind of have in mind different aspects that we may want to think about um, as Moren will present the case study, which is about the coffee industry. Um, so we can, uh, so as you generate ideas together, uh, what are some of the key ESG aspects? Um, first, uh, just to again, make sure we're all on the same page. Different sustainability aspects, I'm sure we all know this, but just to make sure it's about meeting the needs of present generations without compromising the needs of future generations. It's about having a system level thinking about long-term viability. We've heard all of this in the, in the panels um, that we, we just attended. It's about catering to uh, diverse stakeholders and it's about not just the ESG, it's also about the financials. So we want to try to integrate everything together. Um, when we think about uh, corporate responsibility, uh, there are different activities, a wide variety of activities. This is one way to classify them. Uh, there are seven buckets here. There's an extra slide after that. So we can think of different aspects. We can think about leadership, vision, and values. So things like what is the corporate purpose, the values, the vision, the policies and the procedures. We can think about marketplace activities. So con customer relations, product responsibility. We can think about workforce activities such as employee communication and representation, skills, diversity and equality. Uh, we, uh, supply chain, very important, uh, being a fair customer, driving sustainability standards, promoting social and economic exclusion, as we've heard again a lot about uh, recently. We also have, of course, stakeholder engagement, so we want to be able to understand who our key stakeholders are and what their concerns are. We want to be able to interact with them, consult with them, manage them. We want to report on what we're doing. Um, community activities, that's more on the philanthropic side, so donations, volunteering, uh, being a good neighbor, and of course the environment, how do we use our resources, our energies, pollution and waste management, environmental product responsibility, and transportation. So this goes for any kind of business. These are different things that we can think about. But then of course, every business and every industry has its own uh, issues that are more or less material. So what we want to do is we want to be able to prioritize the, the issues that are more material for our case. Um, so for that, we want to look at the firm's business, what can impact the firm's business success and what matters to our stakeholders. So two key questions we may want to keep in mind when we think about a business and whether it's, uh, it's sustainable or not is does a particular ESG issue impact our business significantly in terms of growth, cost, or risk? Uh, or will it affect it in the future, right? We still want to maintain this long-term view. 
And at the same time, is this issue important to our stakeholders? That can be any stakeholders. It can be our investors, but society in general, governments, customers, suppliers, employees, any types of stakeholders. We have heard about SASB also again. Uh, so just to clarify, uh, SASB puts has put together different um, uh, standards and different and, and has, is, is highlighting different issues for different industries. So here you can see under the environmental dimension, they have six uh, possible uh, issue categories. Under the S, which is divided into social capital and human capital, we have 10 uh, issue categories. And under the G, which is divided into business model and innovation and leadership and governance, we again have 10 issue categories. So as I said, today we're going to talk about coffee, uh, about the coffee industry. And this is under non-alcoholic beverages, uh, if we look at the SASB categorization. And here we can see that out of a possible 26 issues that could be relevant, we have eight that are highlighted by SASB. We have uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we have energy management, water and wastewater management, so that's under the E. Under the S, we have customer welfare, selling practices and product labeling, and under the G, which is uh, the part of the business model and innovation, we have product design and life cycle management, supply chain management, as well as material sourcing and efficiency. So again, to help us think a little bit more about these issues, uh, just briefly, what, what are we talking about here? Fleet fuel management, that's about the generation of scope one emissions from uh, transportation and manufacturing facilities. Energy management, that's about energy used to operate manufacturing facilities, distribution centers, and warehouses. Water management, well, we know that companies, especially in the agriculture sector, uses, use a lot of water in their operations. Um, health and nutrition, so when we think about, again, any, any kind of food of be or beverage related um, company, uh, we want to know nutritional and health concerns. We want to look at that. We want to, to make sure that we have a healthy product. Then we have product labeling and marketing. Uh, so how are we communicating about our product to others? How accurate we are? How in depth are we going about what is actually in our product? Um, and packaging life cycle management. So uh, packaging materials is a significant cost and also a lot of material can go into that. Um, and finally, environmental and social impacts of the supply chain. So in agriculture, we, have, we tend to have very uh, complex supply chains and it's the same, uh, it's, it's the case with coffee as well. So there are global supply chains to manage. How do we screen, monitor, engage with suppliers on, in, on the E and the S? Um, and ingredient sourcing, so the ability to source ingredients at a certain price point that can be also quite tricky depending on the supply availability. So to give a brief overview of what the coffee supply chain might look like, and the expert here is Maren, so I will hand it over to her, uh, uh, well, we will hand it over to her uh, shortly. Um, so we see it's quite a complex one, although this is a simplified version. We have very different actors here. We have producers, we have cooperatives, we have different intermediaries, we have exporters, importers, roasters, retailers, and finally, us consumers. Um, and Apparently, there are 70 coffee beans in every single uh, coffee cup that we drink. So just to get the thinking started uh, on, on my end, and then uh, we leave it, uh, on, uh, we, give, we hand it over to you. Um, what kind of ESG areas could we think about for the coffee industry? So of course, climate change, we don't even know, will we be able to grow enough coffee? Where will it be grown, et cetera? Water pollution, water availability also, um, the supply chain, the complexity, the length of the supply chain, all the different actors that are part of it. Uh, currently, there are unfair trade practices going on, unethical labor practices, uh, and in this case, in this kind of industry, harvesting is a very labor-intensive uh, process. Um, there are some poor human rights conditions happening, low living standards, the incomes are quite low, um, there's also fraud on the governance side, and when we think more about us as final consumers, so we have uh, coffee consumption forms, are we using capsules, are we using uh, single-use plastics, etc. 
So this is what I wanted uh, to, to just get you thinking about. Um, and then uh, Eunice will now cover the economics and the financials uh, of what we might want to think about when we look at a business. Thank you, Lila. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Younes Yaksha. I'm the co-founder of uh, GAIN, as, men as uh, Maurice mentioned. And I'm uh, here today to give you the fundamentals of um, impact investing in early stage uh, startups. So the first thing that we uh, search or what we need to understand when we invest in a startups, do you have any, an idea of what is it? The first thing that we need to check, the first, uh, the team, it's one of the, 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 the most important thing. Any other idea? Purpose, yeah, for the impact, uh, impact aspect, what uh, Lila covered. Yeah, it goes with the purpose as well. It goes with the team. Any other idea? Sorry? Values. Values? Okay, so you are all purpose driven here in the room, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> to be more practical, sorry? The business model, yeah. So I'll give you I'll give you the, the, the short answer is the, the problem or the needs. So every behind every startup you need a problem or a need. If you don't have a problem, if you don't have a need, it doesn't matter to start a business. So we're gonna we're gonna check what are the the pain of the customers, if there is really a need behind it. And the last one, to, the last thing we want is to have a, a solution looking for a problem. And you have a lot of startups that uh, does that. Uh, when we speak about problem, we're gonna check the frequency. Is it something that happened to you on a daily basis? on a weekly or on a, if it's like annually, it, it, it doesn't make sense to, to start a business to, to tackle that. And uh, on the need, it's also something that, uh, that uh, you can make big money out of it, but it's gonna be something like much more for conventional businesses where you don't really solve an issue. Uh, and this is not something that we're gonna tackle today. Um, for the second point, you have the market size. So this is something that you need to keep in mind as a venture capital investor or business angel investor. We are um, looking for startups who are in a market of one billion because we suppose that in five to seven years they can capture 10% of the market, which is uh, 100 million of revenues. If it's below, it's too small and usually we don't enter or uh, we don't uh, invest in the startups. If you have any question, please do let me know, okay? Then the third thing is the unit economics. Do you, any, anyone familiar with the unit economics? No? Yes? So unit economics uh, is gonna, uh, are gonna be related to the customer acquisition, how much you will spend to acquire a customer, so we call it the CAC customer acquisition cost, which is very really important. If you need to spend 1,000 to acquire a customer, it's, it's something too high. So usually in uh, SaaS startup, software startup, we are looking for something much smaller. It can be $1, $2, $3, $4, 5 etc. And then uh, when you uh, brought to the table the, the customer acquisition cost, it, we, it is always versus the LTV, the lifetime value. So how many, how much the customer we spend uh, during the, the lifetime when he's uh, with you as a company. And this is the, the, the typical metrics, the unit economics that we check to make sure that uh, your business model is viable. Okay, so there are other, other metrics to, to keep in mind, uh, to, to, to assess, but these are the, the most important. Then you have the product, and the question related to, to the product and to the solution as well is uh, what is new? Why nobody came with the idea before? Is there is a new technology that is enabling uh, this, uh, this solution? Is there is a, a consumer behavior uh, that is changing? And this is something also that, uh, that you need to keep in mind. Then you have the competition. Usually we don't like competition in startups. We're looking for a blue ocean 
when you don't have anyone uh, in the same market. But sometimes, or most of the startups, sometimes they have, they have competition. But the things that you need to keep in mind, and also it will be good for the workshop with uh, Maren, that when you launch startups, you don't really care about competition. Usually we say that it, we say that it takes like 11 months to one year to copy an idea. So you have enough time to, to, to develop the product and especially never focus on the big player like a Google or Microsoft. These are potential exit, but not a competition. And this is something that we see a lot with the new entrepreneur that they, they focus a lot on the competition when they should be uh, exiting the, the competition. And the last point, it's about the team. So the characteristic that we look for a team, the first thing that the founder needs to be coachable, he needs to uh, have enough confidence and uh, enough character. But the most important thing that you need to keep in mind is to be coachable because the last thing that we want is someone that we invest uh, in him or her, but they don't listen, they don't accept advices, and they, don't, they just want like financial uh, investors. There is also uh, something really important in the team because at the end, investing in, in, in startup, it's investing in people. And 90% of the startup that succeed, they pivot. The initial idea is not the final idea uh, that you have uh, one or two years later. And we have uh, some great example like uh, YouTube was, uh, I think, a, a date dating uh, website and become the, 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 the streaming platform. And uh, that's it for me. I will, uh, I will uh, be with you at the end to challenge uh, Maren and the idea from the investor perspective. I don't know if you have any question, if you want to to dive in and, and to, to, to elaborate a point that I mentioned. Yes? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky area, but but we know that when you start, you have like a, a rough idea. You want to 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 develop this business. You want to do so and so, but then um, as a big practitioner of of the lean startup, the idea is when you start, you have a set of hypotheses that you need to converse to convert into facts. You know, and the more fact that you have, uh, the more uh, you will be able to design your business model and, and new things gonna is gonna emerge. So that's why it's really rare when you are into disruptive innovation that you get something like uh, the full picture, 100% of the idea that is, uh, is uh, designed from day one to, 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 uh, to, I would say, the exit or five or six years uh, down the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, I would say that precede yeah to, to to Series A. Usually, it takes two years, one to two years to have the the, the exact idea. So you are in um, you are in a research mode of your business model, right? And then when you are in Series B, C, D, E, F, G, you are executing the idea. You are executing this business model. So that's why the mindset and the skills and uh, the, 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 um, the task or the activities the, that you do in early stage, it's really uh, researching. So that's why we need someone that is curious, someone that is like confident enough that he will one day find this business model, but also to be agile, to be able to pivot or, or, or keep going on the, on the right direction. I think he was sleeping, then he, he put his hand. <laughs> That's what I was saying. <laughs> Please. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, that, that's a very good question. I think the answer, the answer globally is like this, we don't know. But what we want is really the, the, the G from the ESG, about the, someone was mentioning the values and, and, and the purpose, who is behind the idea. And then it's also, I would say, uh, to keep an agile mind, you know? So, so, so for me, when I, 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 I see uh, impact startups, I also put, uh, for example, Zoom. It is not labeled as an impact startups, but the commute that is at, it has saved us during the COVID, the flight, the, the carbon footprint. So it's one of the example of the, of the impact. So I, I really think that we need to reformulate what is impact and we'll discuss it later on. And uh, at an early stage, it's really difficult because you might say, okay, this is too engineer. They only have like a, the, 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 uh, the, they only have like a software and they are not um, wasting uh, water or electricity and blah, blah, blah. So I think it's really, it's, it's tough to measure. And I, I don't know, uh, Lila, if you want to, to save me from the crowd. <laughs> but <laughs> this is something really difficult to, to, to measure, to be honest. A and I know that there are some people that are working on um, designing some fra framework. But for an early business, it's really about the, I would say, the heart and the, and the, the values that the individual has. Of course. It's micro too. Yeah. Um, if I can add something to that, I think it's about um, business planning that an impact entrepreneurship needs to also have um, impact KPIs. And we can project and uh, model and do hypothesis around financial uh, KPIs. So we need to, need to, as impact startups, also include impact KPIs. And you can scale them and you can make hypotheses and say, if I'm scaling, this is what my impact is going to be in five years. And I'll show you uh, an example later on and how we're doing that. Thanks, Mark. Yes, at the back. Thank you. So I'm also in this business. Um, and what I see is that uh, there are many, many good startups out there, many good ideas that receive no funding. Investors, VCs are sitting on a lot of dry powder, uh, 70, 80 percent of dry powder. They're not investing because of uncertainty in markets, inflation, worries, all kinds of worries, i.e. the business plan per se is not what's going to make capital flow, um, even though there are certainly cases which receive funding. It is very frustrating to speak to a lot of uh, entrepreneurs uh, that I do, uh, I sit on boards and stuff, um, who are putting in their own savings and in the end do not get funded because of all kinds of reasons which do have nothing to do with their business plan, their KPIs, and what have you. Um, can you react to that? Yeah, that's a, that's a valid point. That's why we created the game, basically, to, to tackle these challenges. But uh, th th the first thing that you need to keep in mind that is something new for investors, the impact. And when people, they think impact, they think charity, so, but it's not, the, it's not the case. And you also have the issues uh, from, the, from the investors, so that's 100%, I do agree with you. And it will, uh, I hope, uh, move on in the in the next few years. Uh, but also from the the entrepreneur aspect, you have some impact entrepreneur. They uh, forget the profit from the triple P, right? So they have the purpose. Uh, what is the second one? Purpose, planet, and and and, and and people, but but not the profit. And when you start a business, it needs to be like uh, viable, economically viable. And we also have like a lot of, uh, of entrepreneurs, they come with uh, non-profit organizations, so even you cannot own uh, shares, and they are willing to do good for the planet and the, the, the society, but they forget that at the end you are pitching investors, so you can do good by getting financing, financing but you need also to, to be looking at the, the, um, the, 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 the economic and financial aspect also, which as I mentioned for Zoom or for other like uh, impact uh, driven startups, you can make much more profit now uh, than before with an impact uh, driven uh, business. 
Yes. No more question. Oh yes, w w one last question. Hi, it sorry, it's I just a good session, right? arrived, so I don't know if this was maybe tackled or not, but I just wanted to comment on something this gentleman just said, because um, I, I work with both sides, the investors and the impact space or impact opportunities, and I see this so often that, um, you know, a, as you said, great opportunities are out there, great startups. So often the investors say that it's just too early stage, and I think this is so a pity because it's exactly there where they need it. And I feel that sometimes investors should just put their foot down and just say, there is an urgency out there. We really need to move on. And as you say, there's so much money out there. <laughs> so I just wanted to comment. And if, you, if any of you have anything to comment on that, I would love to hear because how can we move this forward? Um, you know, as you say, there's so much happening in the markets um, and, and other reasons why not to invest, but the fact that it's early, too early stage and let's wait until they get to the next milestone, etc. Uh, exactly. I mean, thank you very much then, right? <laughs> so, yeah. King from my heart, I will, uh, <laughs> we'll also tackle that together and you'll have lots of space also to express yourself in that discussion because uh, that's a huge challenge. But, but, but also to, to, to respond to you, it's s sometimes it's an excuse, right? Because if the investor sees that there is a, a, a financial returns that he can make out of the investment, he will do. So usually when people tell you that it's, uh, it's uh, early, er, uh, wh how did, how, what did you say? It's too early. It's too early is that y you don't have traction, and, and that applies to... 90% that uh, f of first time entrepreneurs, first time founders so they come up they pitch and they just have the um, just have the idea so how we can see if it's a real vision or if it's an uh, hallucination right so at we, we need something tangible we need to see at least some traction if it's not paying customers or, or but something concrete right so th so that's also the the, the reason why I wasn't talking about quite that early stage. I do mean actually still early stage, but there is a concept. There is even potentially some revenue. But even then, they still say, oh, we come back when you're looking for mm. 100 million. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's the case for uh, impact er, uh, and non-impact startups. Maren, the floor is, is yours. Cool. <laughs> Can you uh, pull out my PowerPoint um, just so that we get the, the big picture? <laughs> um, we're going to have an interactive session. We thought it would be fun to have you participate. And it's uh, great to see that you are an extremely participative group and that you have things to, uh, to express around the subject. Um, I was asked by, um, by the three of them to present me, I know, as a case study of exactly what you're discussing right now. Um, how can you align impact with financial viability? Um, and what does a business model, successful business model, should look like that responds to all this criteria? Because the problem in the end of the day with uh, impact-driven startups is right now we're relying on some individuals to create impact. Uh, on individuals that are taking their personal financial risk, um, that are putting their lives aside, that have their personal ambitions, and society kind of relies on the fact there's, uh, that there's a couple of crazy people out there who are willing to do that. Um, and but in the end of the day, we can't solve that problem unless we've kind of taken into consideration the stakes of all the of all the stakeholders, of the investors, of society, of the entrepreneurs, in order to try and align all those questions and make a, a business model successful. And that's the question that I'd like to discuss with you today on the um, example of my own startup. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Mia Noa, who has reinvented coffee service and coffee consumption um, for the next generation of consumers. And I wanted to invite you to take that business case and respond together with all your different roles and expertise here in the room to how would you go about solving the problems that we're identifying and then see how that matches what we're actually proposing to the market. Um, to start out with, I'm not going to tell you anything about me, I know, actually, except of the fact that I'm going to offer you a huge problem. 
And then I will ask you to p participate, please, to solve it together. And I think we'll quite easily agree on, on one of the overlying problems we are creating 150 million tons of single-use waste every year. The tendency is still increasing, despite of what you might think here in northern and Western Europe, that we're all taking care of our uh, responsibility and consuming differently on a daily basis. Uh, Lilac will be able to tell us that this is not the case, that unfortunately the waste that we're producing every day is still increasing. Um, who drinks coffee? in this room. Excellent. So you're contributing to 8 million throwaway cups, and I'm only speaking about the cups, not all the other single use, 8 million cups that are thrown out in Switzerland every day, only in Switzerland. Um, is that a problem that touches all of us? Is there a problem? Uh, to respond to Eunice's first thing, uh, are we actually solving a problem here? Problem here. We have a huge problem here, <laughs> Houston. Um, and that's not the only problem with coffee consumption, as I have first position to say, okay, there's a huge supply chain and that's only part of the problem, which is in the very back end when we're actually consuming the coffee. But let's take it apart and solve and try to solve that problem. And then in your daily consumption, do you have other problems with your coffee to go? Who has a problem? I'll tell you one of my problems. I have a huge problem going to a train station, getting my takeaway coffee, and then getting a cover that I don't know which one fits on my, on my cup, trying them all out, and then telling myself, oh damn, am I the only one who did that? Oh no, did everybody all just touch all those covers? Okay, uh, forget about it, I'm taking the one from the bottom. We have a huge hygiene problem with single use as well. So we're contaminating each other all day long. And even after COVID, we still didn't get it, right? You're still going to the train station and you still have the single use materials. You put your hand in the bowl with the sugar. You take the, the, the cover for the lid for your, for your cup and then you put it to your mouth. And I'm watching this I'm like, seriously? We're doing this every day after all we've known. So there's also a, a problem on the experience on the hygiene side. And then I'll give you a problem from the operator point of view. There's a huge staffing issue in the food and beverage industry, right? Pre-COVID, but also after COVID. We don't have consistency. It's difficult to attract talent. You, yeah, and then afterwards, you can retain talent. Um, so that's a huge problem for operators. And now when you're looking at the set of problems that I, I, I gave you and the overlying problem of, of being single use, let's try to solve this, but in a way that will attract investors because I don't want to stay in my basement with my solution, right? I want to offer that to the large public and if I can't sell a viable business case to UNES, then I'm not going to get the funding to make the world change. And whose problem is that? It's my personal problem as an entrepreneur, actually. So making this work helps all of us, but first of all, helps um, an innovative idea um, to, to, to exist simply. So I'm inviting you to fill out the um, business model canvas with me. How would you design a product that solves the problem that I just gave you, but that also is appealing for the different stakeholders that we need to make it happen? Who has an idea of the value proposition? First, have a coffee. That's always a good start. <laughs> Who has an idea on the value proposition? What do what do we need to do? Right. So that's that's a good start. So first of all, for the hygiene. So your value proposition, however, to your client is to bring their own cup. Okay, I'm, I'm still missing the value part in your proposition, so I'm asking you to do something now as my client, but I don't have a proposition to you first. Mm. Any other ideas? Interesting, a tangible advantage. Okay, it will be cheaper. Any other tangible advantages here?
Okay, so y I guess you need an entrepreneur for the creativity part. Um, when <laughs> selling reusable cups, excellent idea. Value proposition, having a reusable cup. Sell the coffee in the cup, okay, why not? Ooh, I like it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, uh, a lot of people uh, hear me talking about a magic coffee fountain sometimes, so you're actually picking up a word that we use at me. I know a lot. Um, there's the concept of human beings being extremely lazy and being extremely self-oriented. So it's nice to want to be able to save the world. Really, I agree with that. I also want to save the world, but <laughs> I don't want it to be costly. I don't want it to be uncomfortable, and I don't want to make any sacrifices on my daily life quality, right? This is how we humans work. So this, is, this was kind of our first understanding to say, okay, yes, for sure, this has to do with your own cup. That's the only long-term solution to solve the, the single-use waste problem, is to change behavior. But changing behavior for free, just in order to save the world as if it, this wasn't enough, <laughs> unfortunately, humans don't do that. So we need an attractive value proposition. What can that be? That can be better quality for the same price, right? So we always said, okay, we need something that is so high quality that you'd even make an effort an, an, an extra effort, a non-monetary effort to do so. Extra quality, a better price, because then all of a sudden your supply chain changes. You don't have single um, use materials to stock, to operate, to, to sell, uh, and, and to organize. So you can pass on that price advantage to your clients. You have another one. Yes, service, excellent, personalized service. That's, that's what we do in food and beverage. We create magic, magic moments, right? And you can personalize service by saying, you know, if you come drink your coffee with us, you don't need to repeat yourself. It'll be more comfortable. You don't need to touch anything. It's more hygienic and it's better quality. So you need a lot of good um, value propositions in order to make that, first, uh, make that start from the beginning. Does that seem easy to you? <laughs> if you have the right concept, yes. Um, it's terribly difficult an impact to have a value proposition that appeals to everyone and responds to everyone's needs, including Eunice's need for being uh, economically viable. And the value proposition that you put forward really needs to be thought through entirely to be realistic because again, just for your pretty eyes and for, for uh, changing in the world where you don't see it, that's not going to happen. Humans need a tangible financial and quality experience advantage in order to change their behavior. So that's part of, of our answer uh, with me and Noah was the value proposition to say, it needs to be better, it needs to be faster, it needs to be more comfortable, it needs to be more hygienic, and it needs to be better. And all of that, only to make you do one thing, is bring your own cup. So, all of that effort behind the scenes. And then you ask your, your next question, who's your customer? Who has an idea of who our customer could be at Mia and Noah? It could be like individual individuals or uh, other businesses that need uh, to provide coffee. That's exactly the question. Who's your customer? Is it the operator or is it you who are drinking coffees every day? So us drinking coffee every day as well. Is it? Or would I like the operator to adopt the system to spread out more quickly? Yeah. I think both are right. However, for the purpose of this exercise, let's stay with the B2C. Why stay with the B2C? Because investors are humans. And Eunice wants to first buy the concept and first understand, yeah, I would drink that coffee. So I n we need to concentrate on the B2C. Otherwise, we're not going to sell to B2B because the B2B person also drinks coffee and also has a cup and is asking himself the question straight away. The first question that I ask you, do you drink coffee? That's the first question that I ask in a pitch as well to investors. Do you drink coffee? 
okay, so I'm already in that world. I can imagine your, your product. So let's focus for, for now on the, on the B2C. And who is your B2C customer? You need to be able to describe that customer in order to appeal to them. Yes. For example, great. Conscious consumers, where do they exist? Where are they? Here? I, can go, um, I don't know, maybe in the organic uh, restaurants. Uh, okay. Or like, uh, I don't know, uh, fair trade clothes. Uh, I mean, these distribution points where, yeah. Great example. And there's something in there. What do you mean sustainable consumers? What do you mean um, pendulaire commuters? Why? Because they live in developed countries, unfortunately, and their first interest is not how do I get to the end of the month with my salary, but how can I make an effort to save the environment? Switzerland is a great example of that. It's because of our uh, life quality that is so extremely high compared to the rest of the world that people are behaving more sustainably because sustainability today is still something that asks more effort and is more expensive than the regular polluting product, unfortunately. Um, so today, if you go to a regular automated coffee uh, concept, that will be less expensive than getting organic fair trade coffee from a barista bar, right? And that's a problem, an impact. And as long as impact, or as long as responsibility is more expensive than being irresponsible, that's a huge problem and that makes it much more interesting for impact-driven startups to be here in northern Western Europe to start out with because this is where our consumers already have that mindset and don't have to worry about even bigger issues like healthcare, like security, right? So when you're thinking about your customer, and then Younes made a great opening because he said you need to be agile, you need to be able to change, you need to be able to change your minds. Um, when we started out with me, I know I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story. I made it for a commuter. It was a product that we designed for a commuter because I was a commuting executive mom. Spent 1,400 Swiss francs every year on takeaway coffee in order to pollute my children's future environment, I don't quite understand, and spend a lot of money for bad coffee. And I said to myself, well, wouldn't it be so nice to have a magic coffee fountain that would fill up my own cup with my own coffee wherever I am, in Geneva or in Zurich, and I'll just go and I always get the same flat white with oat milk without even talking to anyone and by pure magic. This was the reason why we designed Mia Inua. And then we figured out during our organic traction and, 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 and piloting phase that no, unfortunately, no, commuters, they don't care. They don't have time for that. Or maybe not yet. So then you need to be able to ask yourself, to, to, to put your, pull yourself back and say, okay, well, no, uh, commuters own, 13% of commuters only bring their own cup today. That's not enough to create a viable business. Unfortunately, let's look the reality in, there <laughs> in its eye. We need to switch to an environment where the cup is less of a barrier and ask ourselves the question, who else, where else can I find that person? Um, maybe in an organic vegan restaurant, maybe in the office space, maybe in a captive market, maybe in the educational sector, maybe somewhere else. And maybe only later, in five or 10 years, consumer behavior will have changed enough to then go to the public and, uh, and to the transport system and appeal to consumers. Let's talk about revenue streams. So now we agree we have a cool value proposition, right? We have, we kind of have a client, it's a responsible client in a developed country. How do we create revenue streams? <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> Okay, excellent. I love that. How? Which? A 
additional products that revolve around the core product. Yes. Of creating value added components that add into that, bringing in pastries, bringing in cheeses, adding other things to the, the mix. Okay, why not? Um, and then you can do pastry and cheeses, you can do software as well, you can be creative on, on the different streams that you're, but who's paying you? The consumers. I mean, you're, you're drawing, a, you're, you're now attracting a larger customer base from that because somebody's core product may be different than what your core product is, so you're creating value-added components to bring into the product base. Okay, interesting. Any other ideas around here? So you're saying to integrate the the, s the value chain actually and say okay we're not making the 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 money with the end consumer we're actually making it with the import transport and tarification of coffee that can be an idea. Thank you very much by the way because you're kind of solving my business case for free. But <laughs> okay, any other idea? Interesting. Now I'll tell you a reality. Uh, sorry, I'm picking on you all the time, Younes, because uh, you're such a good uh, victim for that from the, <laughs> from the investor point of view. That's what we thought. We thought, oh yeah, we're, we're going to sell our coffee, right? And then our revenue stream will be the end consumer and they will pay for our coffee. And then we can have chocolate drinks and matcha and all types of things and also sell cups and that will be our revenue stream. Uh, how much do you think investors like to invest into the food and beverage industry right now? <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> Extremely vulnerable business, especially after COVID, where we don't even have the, the people there. The traffic is not there. The restaurant business is breaking down. And then you're having an impact startup and you say, why don't you invest into my food and beverage business, please? I am going to scale to X. And then all investors will all of a sudden be like, oh yeah, yeah, we, we have a great concept, but um, food and beverage we don't do right now, right? Because there's too much uncertainty around that. There's too much uncertainty about behavior. Are people going back to the office? Are people going back to the train station? So on and so forth. So that's another point where we, I don't want to say got it wrong, but got it differently in the beginning from where we ended up now. We're not selling coffee anymore. We're selling a new service process and a new system that enables food and beverage players to sell zero waste coffee. And all of a sudden the value proposition, so you're completely right, is a different product. It's not coffee anymore. It's a process that enables you to become sustainable. It's reporting, it's data, it's customer engagement, um, it's a CRM. It's everything that, that we created that we thought was a secondary product but it's not. It's the product that we're going to scale and that we're going to live from. Because if you want to scale, if you want to sell that concept successfully to an investor, well, you need to assure them that it's economically viable. And if you don't find investments, you're not going to be able to do that. So that's another part where the initial idea and then the response later on uh, really differ from each other. I don't know where I'm in timing. It's OK. Huh? Um, what resources do you need to do that? So now you know how we're developing revenue streams. We have a value proposition, right? We've solved the problem. We've solved the problem. We have a customer segment. So what do we need? Yes, that's interesting, and that's always the question. Um, in the introduction, Younes already said, when you're an entrepreneur and you're setting out something, you don't look so much on the on the big guys. Why? Because they're an exit strategy for you. Let's do the case study together. Let's 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 say, why would Nespresso 
not copy me, I know, and the value, um, the, the value proposition that we just created together. Why would they not? behavior has not been changed yet, so that's why maybe they will be reluctant to, to do it for the moment. Because the behavior is not, it's not here yet. So, uh, You're kind of creating not only a service, but kind of creating a, a new behavior for customers. Correct. So let's, let's take that into real life. We're sitting on the board of directors of Nespresso today, the, the 40 of us together. <laughs> It's going to be fun. And I'll come to you and I'll say, uh, well, you guys, uh, I have a really great impact idea. Uh, we're stopping all cups. We're putting a huge barrier into, into consumption. We're stopping all capsules. And we're also stopping all the flavor stuff, all the flavors that we're selling for 40 years now. And we have that huge customer database. We're going to stop that all. Who raises their hand to give a go to that project? Oh, nobody. <laughs> Oh, how surprising. You have only stuff to lose when you're a big player, right? So doing that, being disruptive, big players don't do that. That's what, wh what they do is five, 10 years later, when all the entrepreneurs are burned out and, and poor from investing their own money, then they'll choose the idea, then they'll buy it and have it in parallel. But they're not gonna disrupt because they only have stuff to lose when they disrupt. If you are Nespresso and you have high revenues, anybody from Nespresso here, by the way? If, uh, millions of revenues, why would you decide from one day to the other to cut them to a fraction by completely changing your business model? So that's one of the things, not all of the things, that's one of the things that protect us. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to challenge you, saying yes. that yes, they do disrupt. Philip Morris is a good example. It's not the, maybe the best one, but they disrupted their own cells with their ICOs. And just at the moment when the traditional smoking was still as popular as ever. Yes, maybe mm -hmm. that's, that's a good example. A lot of big players have venture arms, do research and development, and do invest because they know that the consumer is moving and that tendencies are moving. Um, have they completely developed that in-house, or was the idea maybe picked up from a, a disruptor, a startup, and then integrated and bought? I don't know that, but I believe you. Uh, and it's true that it does happen, and it's true that most of the big players in food in the food and beverage uh, industry do have a, a, an impact arm or a venture arm that is looking for that type of thing. But what they do is they they look at the market and they look they look at what's happening, but they usually don't produce that in house. I have another reason why there is a barrier for the big players to do that type of thing. So you're sitting with Nespresso, right? You're in all the countries in the world. You're selling millions and, and billions of of, of coffees, single use coffees to the world. And now here in Switzerland, you're, you're sitting in VV and we're deciding on the new product now. Um, okay, let's do this. How is it going to be, it be designed? What is it going to look like? Who decides? It takes ages for big players to take disruptive decisions because they need to please everyone because they have an existing business. And that's a huge barrier. All of a sudden you can't be like, uh, uh, two co-founders in a tiny startup in, in Geneva say, oh, I like that color, why don't we do that? Oh, no, we do only zero contact, we don't take uh, uh, cash money. Uh, which blend do we take? Oh, why don't we just have a focus group vote on it? If you're Nespresso, you can't do that because you need to satisfy the Italian market, like the Brazilian market, like the UK market, like the Swiss market. And then decision-making um, is so difficult and takes so long that in the end of the day, a couple of crazy people with startup ideas are quicker than you, even if you have all the money and all the expertise in the world. And that's just a reality. Yes. I think the, previ I thi I think the previous comment was relevant. Uh, big players, they develop very often in-house those disruptive technology. Sometimes they buy a startup, they put in the fridge. 
but they put in secret a number of engineers to develop those solutions. They will not push them commercially as long as it's more profitable to go with the traditional business and the day where the public opinion has changed, the day where the regulatory world has changed, boom, they do the switch. But where the startup has put 10 people or 20 people, they have put five times more. And they can use their financial muscle to do the switch. So it's very dangerous, I think, for the startups. We have to always keep in mind those guys who don't show it, do it below the radar, but be ready for the day where it's not possible to stay with the traditional business. I agree with you. I completely agree with you. And that does mean you should completely close your eyes on competition. I'm just answering to the, to the, to the question, why don't they? Because they have the means, as you're saying, and just the way to go about this is very different and takes longer, as you're saying, and takes a lot more money. Um, as you're saying, but will they eventually catch up? Are you protected from competition anywhere? I don't think so. But, so. but also because uh, there, there is the, the risk factor. When you launch a startups, I mean, you bear all the risks. And one large corporate, I mean, they concentrate on the, on the core businesses. R why? Because when they want to do innovation, so either they are buying, building, or partnering, or doing open innovation. So for them to go into a completely disruptive uh, innovation or a new market is something too risky. They don't know uh, how much they're gonna be spending, if it will succeed, and who will take the responsibility inside the, inside the, the, the company to go after something that we still uh, have only hypotheses and uncertainties. And the, 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 the second reason why they don't do it also because it's also related to the uh, profit formula. Usually if you have like a profit margin which is like maybe 60, 70 percent, why you would go to 10, 15, 20, 30 percent uh, margin? It just doesn't make sense. And then they also don't have the right people with the right mindset to develop a startup. We, s we say that I I in a startup it's like the knife and, uh, and the compass. You need to figure out uh, along the way to do so, so it requires uh, other perspectives, other another mindset, and it's something that uh, in-house you don't usually have. So that's why large corporates are reluctant to uh, do disruptive innovation. They will do innovation, like you mentioned about Philip Morris, which is more sustaining innovation but not disruptive innovation. They are not targeting or creating a new market or targeting low-end customer, which is the definition of, uh, of disruptive uh, innovation. So that's why it's easier for Nespresso or, or Philip Morris to acquire a startup for 100 million or 300 million or 1 billion with Microsoft and all these big players than spend the money uh, with nothing and have the risk also to, 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 to fail. Because no, one's inside the no one inside the corporate wants to uh, be the one, the, be the, the, the guy who failed, especially when you don't have any incentives. So for example, if uh, Maya and Noah uh, succeed, they own maybe 100% or 50% uh, equity uh, of the company, you might exit and being like a uh, 100 million uh, ultra high net worth individual. But when you work in a company, you don't have incentive, you don't have stocks in this business. So why even, even the an intrapreneur would uh, would uh, would spend time on on trying to to create something new. So that's a big problem for a large corporate, and that's why they prefer to buy uh, startups like uh, Google and and all these uh, these big guys. Yes, I I tend to agree with you in the food and beverage industry. Um, that uh, that's really the the typical way uh, things go, and that also has to do with the framework that you presented, Lilac, on the corporate social responsibility and sustainability that is 360%. How do you attract talents that are disruptive and how do you make them maybe uh, shareholders in order to, to have uh, entrepreneurs in your, com in your company and be able to create that, that spirit in, uh, with bigger players? That's a, that's a huge question. Um, so before I tell you how we went about, and then you, you can challenge our business model and you can challenge the way we do things in our concept, what are the resources that you think are necessary for 
an impact-driven startup? The key resources for our value proposition. I agree with you, yes. Okay, excellent. But, but, but tech first, I mean, to develop all yeah. these uh, tools that you're referring to in terms of your uh, um, reporting, assessing, yep. and all through CRM, and, and, then, and then comes next is like a good way to communicate about it, right? I mean, it's like okay, so you're saying we need sales and marketing, yeah. and we need a solid tech resource. Yeah. Any other ideas? I agree with you. Is the coffee is the is the coffee market fiercely competitive? Do you think you need a lot of perseverance and passion? Of course. Nobody wants you there. They don't want you there. They don't want you to steal the coffee and then d d do things differently. So you get a lot of resistance. So you need that definitely and that's something you can't buy. Is there anything else you need? Suppliers? Yeah, absolutely. You need uh, uh, partners, good supply chain. You need access to the market. You need access to your partners and your locations, of course. So you na need to go to, to have partners for your go-to-market strategy. And of course, and this is what the Sustainable Finance Week is about, you need money. <laughs> you just said it. <laughs> you need the money. I just heard you need sales and marketing, lots of sales and marketing. Yes, that's right. Um, but impact-driven startups don't have money to have that. So that is one of the key factors, obviously, that we make the finance world or impact-driven startups attractable, uh, at attractive for investors because that's one of the key resources we need, right? You find a tech guy, you find, you find all of that stuff, but we need to be able to pay for it. So I think it's the time that I tell you a little about a bit about how we responded to the same questions that we've just responded to, and I'm pretty reassured to learn that um, the solution that we've just created together is quite similar to the solution that um, my co-founder and I created together is called Mia and Noah, and maybe let's start out with that name. Um, Mia and Noah is for us a synonym of next generation. It's simply the uh, most popular baby names in Switzerland over the past five years. So it's a user-generated name, I like to say. It's a completely statistical name. Those are not our children. Um, and the message is clear, and it's not only a single-use message. It's a message of, let's do business for the next generation. And that means 360% making a tailor-made solution that responds to all the necessities that we need to respond to um, and, and the impact that we need to create, because as we just said, it is much more simple to create a solution from scratch than to change a huge player in order to comply with impact, um, with impact necessities. So what have, we, what have we done, the magic coffee fountain? We've taken it all away, started from zero. Say, okay, let's take it all away, everything you know about coffee, let's stop it all. If it was possible, using technology today, to personalize your coffee here, instead of using single-use materials. And then using the technology that exists today in order to save your own coffee recipe that'll come directly ready to consume the way that you like it into your own cup, wouldn't that be a cool thing? And for that, wouldn't I bring my own cup if I would really get my favorite coffee every time and without touching any single-use? So that was basically what we did, so we digitalized your personalization process that you know as in taking off lid, it, putting in sugar, stirring, then going away, having contaminated yourself and having uh, polluted everything. And we said, okay, well, let's use technology for good, let's do that. And then let's give you the opportunity to save those settings, to save those settings and say, that's my favorite coffee, I always want that, I have a routine. I can e either generate that once, I can save it to my profile, or I can print it on my cup. So then it's making it even more comfortable and easy to be sustainable because I don't need anything but my cup to consume. 
I have a zero stop process. I don't need to first order, then spell my name to a teenager, then pay, then personalize my coffee, then leave. But all of a sudden, I'm just coming with my cup to the magic fountain. I scan it, I put down my cup, and I leave. And I know what I get, and I know what I get every time, and I don't repeat myself. And I'm happy, and it's consistent. And then, oh my god, then it's automated. Oh, we're taking away all the emotion from food and beverage. If I do that process the way that we've just did, we just designed it together, all of a sudden it becomes automation. Food and beverage investors don't want to invest into automation because they want the sexiness of real concepts. Food and beverage concepts live from their emotional appeal. That's why, even d difficult for you maybe to adhere to that, but that's why Ma uh, McDonald's is targeting children. That's why big players are buying nice niche concepts because they're so punchy that it's, it needs an entrepreneur and the passion and the love of an entrepreneur to create them. And that's what a food and beverage investor will buy. So nobody wants to have like a, an automated thing that comes from a television of the 1980s that is all black and you have to bend down to get your coffee out of a, uh, out of a plastic slot. So we figured, no, we need to make it sexy and cool to be sustainable. You need to be seen for what you, you, you do, right? You're behaving correctly and you're having a great coffee. That can't be an embarrassing thing in front of an, aut uh, in, in front of an automated vending machine. Swiss quality consumers, they go to barista coffees, they go to V Cafe, they go to Boreal, they don't go to a vending machine. So we said, okay, let's then invent the new next generation of vending machines from real materials with service height, with the service appeal, with an emotional experience that you get, yes, from an automated solution, which is only the tool, but it's not the objective of the, of the concept. So we designed the hardware to go with our software, if you wish so, and gave it a brand appeal and said, now you're going to a vending machine by choice and not because it's four o'clock in the morning and you ended up in the, air, in the airport and there's nothing else simply. And then, of course, in the end of the day, that's what we spoke about from the beginning. If all of this is so pretty and so good and makes so much sense and has so many advantages, then in the end, I can ask my consumer to make an effort and change their own behavior and to bring their own cup. And that's a huge change for everyone today. Um, in the, this room, you're all interested in sustainability. That's why you're here. So I'm not talking about it to the right crowd. But when we had our first prototype at a commuter train station, and I spoke to people, to clients there, and said, well, there's no cup, you know. It only gives coffee, and the coffee will just flow into the, in, into the hole down there if you don't put your cup. I have people thinking I'm crazy. Like, but what do you mean? Do you mean I should bring my own cup? And then I just respond, yes, that's exactly what I mean, actually. That's exactly what I think is the future is going to look like. It's all going to be prohibited anyway one day, right? Geneva, the canton of Geneva has just decided that. Three weeks ago, they decided they're going to ban single use from food and beverage service as of 20, uh, 2025. But a lot of customers still look at you saying, but you can't be serious. I'm not going to put a dirty cup into my bag afterwards. I'm not going to carry around a bag. And that's the initial reaction that you get. So all of what you have to do in your value position to make it sexy and cool to change that behavior, that's really where the, um, where the music and where the solution is in our opinion. And then all of a sudden the problem that we had discussed earlier, 150, 000, uh, 150 million tons of single use every day, no, Mia Noa is not going to take away all those 150 million tons by, th by itself. No, we're not. We all need to participate in tons of concepts, lots of concept, concepts all along the value chain that Lilac presented. But we can contribute, and contribute very importantly, not only in providing a, a solution for food and beverage, but also by all of a sudden making it more comfortable to be sustainable than being not sustainable. So what happens when you've done all of that? Yes, Eunice. Uh, just for the sake of time. Yes. We wanted Done. to get the, the feedback from the audience, and the, the question is very simple. Would you invest in Maya and Noah? What's, what are your feedback? Any question uh, about the strategy? And, and I mean, if we could, uh, if we could uh, discuss about that. We need traction first. Let me put on the next slide uh, yeah, the, before the they decide as investors. Yeah. Traction, that's the most important thing. 
this is the only slides I brought, by the way. So th this is <laughs> at the end, but I had until 3.25, according to the plans. Is that, am, am I running over? We just want to get the okay. So all of a sudden, if you solve that, you have your favorite coffee in your favorite cup. No waste, not all the stuff. You haven't spoken to anyone before getting your first uh, espresso in the morning. You haven't waited around, and you're not worrying about, is there an error margin in the product, the product that I just got? Is there really oat milk because I don't digest uh, dairy milk or, or, or whatever type of question? And on the operator side, all of a sudden, your solution, you have all data, all of a sudden, you know who consumed your coffee and when and how. You can speak to those people. You can engage with them. That's something that you can't do in the former world of uh, regular coffee bars. And you know everything about operations, about standard operating procedures, about temperatures, about inventory. You have it all. You have full power and control about what you're selling and how you're selling it. And this is what we need so that you can answer Eunice's uh, question. Traction, organic, purely organic traction and purely um, generated from the force of two entrepreneurs with friends and family investors um, and our own money. And that's how far we got organically without um, taking, getting uh, institutional investors on board. Um, we have a pilot series of coffee bars that we had built from that money, that's which are five uh, coffee bars that are all installed in different environments, four of them in the, in the educational sector, one in a, a corporate captive environment. We have um, today more than 4,000 customers that needs to be updated, already two institutional franchisees, protected IP, great product market fit and great loyalty from our existing customers. And now you can answer the question from you, Younes. Yes, Ple please. Just wait for the, the mic, please. Maybe just some thoughts. I think for me, coffee is a bit tricky because it's about experience. It's about social experience. Maybe it's not about drinking per se, but it's uh, having a discussion, having being able, because I guess people go to Starbucks not to drink coffee maybe, but just to sit down, to enjoy. So here, the question is sustainability is important, but social factor also should be there, I guess, because coffee is a bit uh, different from any other. It's not the water, I guess. It's not the mm. same that you drink because you're thirsty m most of the time. So I guess it's a bit, yeah. For me, some maybe questions should be also addressed. And w vending machine, maybe for me, doesn't necessarily solve this type of social maybe aspect. doesn't reflect it. Two things leap out at me about this. If, if I was an investor, 100%, I'd throw everything into this, and, there's, and it's based on two factors. The first is that you're appealing externally in a niche market by taking the two names of the most popular names given to children in Switzerland and naming that after your firm. You, you bought emotionally into the future in large scale, because if that's because everybody who named their kid one of those two names is already pre-bought in some fashion. The second, and, but it's a uniquely Switzerland thing, okay, but I suppose you could replicate that elsewhere. The second thing is what you said was that Switzerland or Geneva or whomever has already regulated the elimination of all of this plastic and, and other kind of waste. And everybody who wants to hang on today's emotive feelings are going to be wiped out because their cups are going to be taken away. So then what's the choice? It's not whether you feel like this is a communal thing that you buy into for coffee drinking under a certain design. If your cup's taken away from you, this is a monopoly killer app coming that basically you have bought the future ahead of it. And what's going to happen is what comes to you is the results of somebody's now going to have to find an alternative, and you're the early market penetrator with the only and, and, and a highly appealing answer that already speaks to the gourmand nature of an upscale society. 
this isn't a universal solution in every place, but, but, but you know, sustainable development is local as well as global. And, and you, all your matrix line up, basically laying out all of the sustainability goals. But from the standpoint of pure profit, oh my God, yeah, 100%. That's my answer. Cool, thank you. I think it's a good idea because it's hundred percent customizable. It also addresses some of the feeling issues. The point on which, if I was an investor, I would try to insist is to have more than five coffee bars. So there is an element of capex, is the machine, and it's the location of those right. machines. Absolutely. Hi, um, I'm concerned actually about the user experience uh, and the choice of the locations that you mentioned. Because uh, I think uh, if the locations are far from a place where the user can actually wash his, uh, his cup of coffee, etc., uh, then uh, this can be challenged by uh, consignment uh, reusable cups by someone else, someone that has a lot of shops that ca can have a, dispo uh, a bin for used items that they can wash and then recirculate. And I'm wondering why you're not going into uh, office building cafeterias where people have access to you know, uh, a place where they can wash their mug and then use it again. That's what we're doing. You're completely right. Um, too early to be out in the open and uh, somewhere far from an infrastructure that provides you with a cup. And that's why um, currently in our strategic development, we concentrate on the captive market, so corporate business and, um, uh, and educational sector. Only corporate business, market size three billion, premium vending only. And that's uh, Europe, US. So we have more than enough to do in the corporate business because before the consumption behavior is actually there so we can go into the public. Thanks. Yes. No, thank you very much for this presentation. So, um, just three comments. The, so, the first one, what I really like in your presentation is the turning point. You know how you turn it from, uh, yeah, okay, there is no traffic in like train station, things like that. So we 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 build that, um, and maybe it's what the gentleman was was about to say. I see this business model quite replicable to some other content and coffee. You know, I mean, you, you could very much like go in a grocery shop and just get your best cereal, you can get your best shampoo, and you bring like your own container and you just like fill it up, right? Um, so that's that's one comment. Uh, the second comment, because the question would <laughs> was like, would you invest into it? I mean, okay, it's, it's tricky. I would definitely use it um, and, uh, and I would be interested to consider further to invest into it. Um, but for that, I would need more data. And also here, if I may say, but we have that many time, uh, you do not emphasize, you know, all the, the data you get out of all this like consumer experience. And by the way, um, I've got really like lots of ideas that, you know, you can build up in some like uh, very empty zone um, of like coffee shop where you can say, oh, by the way, you can tag the local community who come every time and just say, we can fix a, a meeting point and then it could be even like cross-generational and, and this and that. So anyway, that's what I say. But my last and, and main point as far as I'm concerned is what you put like in this little black box where you put like tons of waste eliminated, liters of milk saved. Um, so not sure about this one, but tons of like CO2 reduced. What do you do about that? So are you still looking for some like funding and do you monetize that, okay, in a good way, of course? Because that, for me, you know, is worth a lot and has to be part of the monetization. And that's what I do with my, my business model. We can talk later. But um, 
but but that is definitely something very interesting because that's the other thing you know when you came with your business case at the beginning it sounds like well, we can't solve that and yes you did so very well done to you i mean but but that has a very good impact and if you monetize it in a good way you know it's like also to give you some further funding to develop like in other con content like shampoo and things like that i think absolutely agree with yeah. all of the so above yeah. so you do monetize the black box right we don't yet. Okay. You're, you're t speaking about an early stage uh, startup that d has their first organic traction. Um, but do we have ideas and how uh, also how to use data, how to use our IT and so on okay. and so forth differently? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, from from an investment side of it, the traction slide in a deck is always one of the most important from there and it piqued the interest uh, and that's what you want from a pitch deck is to pique the interest and generate new questions that are better questions from that side of it from a scalability size of how fast you can scale within the country within europe globally what the manufacturing capacities can be how fast can it go can the manufacturing IP be translated, be shared into a different con country to be able to expand globally faster. Uh, there are some of the questions from that side about what that cost of production would be and the capex would be in different markets from there. And if those are answered question, uh, not just invest, I'd be interested in franchises in some countries. <laughs> Okay, that's a cool comment, thank you. Um, interesting, and also that is uh, a response that you need in the business model, the CapEx, somebody else already mentioned it. Yes, there is a CapEx component, nobody likes CapEx components, and over the, the business model that is based on a system rent, then you, can, you, you have solutions for that. Um, and that's also a response to you, what do we do, how do we develop going on from here? franchise, but also white labeling, saying, you know, let's give that solution to others and maybe they'll use it differently, maybe they'll use it for shampoo. Absolutely. And what Younes said, obviously, by what's the most important, um, to have a really sticky, strong, close team. We're a family business, um, we're cousins, simply. My cousin is the one who's um, responsible for admin analytics IT, and I'm the one who has um, created the concept, and I'm really all about the food and beverage experience and about the love uh, in it. And in the end of the day, what I'm interested in is that you love the coffee that you have in your own cup. And as a combination, um, that is the team you need and also the, the, the liaison that you need um, in order to be successful together. The, the last question, maybe, if, uh, if it's a question. Yeah. All right, so very quickly, um, on the consumer experience, and I, I love the model, but on the consumer experience, how much does the user get to know about waste that they're reducing by using the, the coffee cup, right? Because then they get to social it out, share it out on social, and if you think about next generation's activity and where they care and what they like to do, if you get to say, hey, you know what, I'm using this cup, push it out to people, you get that viral aspect. I love the model, but if you're not capturing that data, not only for yourself as an organization, which you obviously are, but allowing the consumer to participate in that impact, the sky's the moon. Like you, The next generations care way more about than my generation and older. Correct. Um, that's why you have a live tracker, impact tracker, about your community and yourself on our app. Um, so you can see how many kilograms of say you've saved. You can say share that. and. Our operations partners, they get uh, an impact reduction statistic from us um, that they can also share with their workforce uh, uh, and with their students, for example, absolutely. Perfect, thank you very much. I'm sorry we're running late, but uh, I mean, it's still the beginning of the week, so there's still time for questions. We're gonna stay in the lobby, and uh, Marin uh, is gonna be here for you for further more questions and for new investment uh, ID. So I yes. wanted to thank you, Building Bridges, for the organization and for inviting us. A special thanks to TBH Family Office and uh, Geneva Angel Investor Network.
And of course, for Marin, for running the show, don't forget to download the app and more, more importantly, to get your cup. And actually, she got some cup yeah. for, for the one of you that were more active because ultimately that was a workshop. So thank you very much, guys, and uh, have a great week ahead.